my, my pleasure to uh, uh, welcome uh, Nikani back to uh, the ABI. Nikani uh, was uh, one of uh, the students that, um, two students that Marty and uh, Andrew and, and I had who was working on abusive head trauma. So uh, Nikani's uh, sort of main thrust was uh, looking at the measured uh, shaken uh, profiles uh, that uh, we had obtained from um, Tom's uh, uh, PhD work, but then using computational models to analyze the deformation of the soft tissue mechanics under those uh, uh, shaking regimes. And I think, uh, you know, Nikini, you, you did an excellent job. You made some, uh, um, you know, really nice uh, um, predictions uh, and uh, provide, uh, provided us with a, uh, uh, a tool that uh, has been, um, well, hopefully will be, uh, uh, you know, very useful from a clinical uh, perspective. Um, one of the things that uh, Nikini did achieve was to look at the various measures of uh, um, uh, deformation and uh, um, stress that occurred within the, uh, the brain, the soft tissues that uh, make up the brain, and compared those with the published thresholds for, uh, for injury to, to get a better handle on uh, where uh, injuries might occur within the, uh, the brain and under what conditions uh, um, these uh, uh, injuries uh, uh, might be invoked. So at the moment Nikini is uh, living in uh, Melbourne and uh, working for TSG, <laughs> the software, no, no so the simulation, simulation group, group. No. Um, <laughs> as a consulting engineer and uh, by all accounts seems to be enjoying life over there. <laughs> yeah. cool. So thank you and we look forward to it. Thanks for that Paul. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say it's, it's, it's an honour to give the speech to my peers. Um, I've done my PhD for the last five or so years, um, and it's been an amazing journey, and there's a good way to um, close it out, I think. So as Paul said, my PhD was on soft tissue deformations in abusive head trauma. Cool. So abusive head trauma, or more commonly termed shaken baby syndrome, refers to a triad of injuries seen in mistreated infants. These in injuries include subdural hematomas, which is when there's bleeding between the brain and the skull, retinal hematomas, which is when there's bleeding behind the eye, and brain swelling. There's a very high incident rate of abusive head trauma worldwide, with a rate of about 14 in every 100,000 infants per year. However, there's still a lack of scientific evidence linking the injuries that are seen uh, uh, to a deliberate shaken action. And it's this lack of scientific evidence that uh, comes up in many court cases. So it's thought that computational models might be able to provide uh, a mechanistic relationship between a deliberate shaken action and the injuries that are seen. So here at the ABI, the main question that, um, uh, that our group is trying to answer is, is shaken alone sufficient uh, to elicit the injuries that are seen in shaken baby syndrome. To answer this question, we've broken down the problem into three separate uh, sections. <laughs> uh, the first is to couple the head and torso kinematics. So that's basically trying to figure out how the head moves when the torso is shaken. Um, and as Paul mentioned, um, a previous PhD student called Tom, Thomas Linton uh, completed that by using rigid body dynamics. The second part was to use those head motions and figure out uh, the stresses and the strains on the, on the brain um, when the head is experiencing those motions. Uh, so that was what my PhD was on about, and I um, went about trying to complete that by using fine element modeling. Um, and finally, we'd want to correlate these predictions to the observed injuries that are seen, um, and that could be done by um, having a proper um, animal model that we can link the injuries, uh, that we can link the soft tissue deformations that we see in our computational model to the injuries that we see in the animal model. Uh, yeah, so that's what I worked on and that's what most of this talk will be on. Uh, so when I was trying to predict the stresses and the strains, uh, I broke 
uh, that problem down in three separate sections as well. Uh, the first set of work was concentrating on phantom experiments. Uh, these allowed me to um, perform controlled experiments on simplistic phantoms uh, and determine how important certain aspects um, were to the main problem. For example, how important the fontanelle was or how, uh, how to model the uh, motion of the brain relative to the skull accurately. Once these phantoms were created, uh, computational models were set up and the techniques used to create these computational models, such as the contact conditions, were validated using the experimental results uh, from the phantom experiments. Uh, the second part, um, we were quite fortunate to get some data from a group in America um, who had performed in vivo adult uh, head rotation, in, uh, in vivo adult brain, adult brain <laughs> deformations. And um, so we had that data set. So we used that to kind of validate the techniques that we um, had formulated in our phantom experiments in a more realistic adult um, setup. Um, and then finally, the third part was to use all of those computational techniques and set up an um, infant model and then um, apply the shaking boundary conditions to that infant model and uh, predict certain mechanical indices from that model. Cool. Um, so the first set of uh, phantom experiments uh, that were done were the cube phantom studies. So the main aim of these was to develop a computational framework uh, that was required to model the pressure experienced by a gel under a shaking motion. So in this series of studies, I, I created three phantoms, a non-slip, a slip, and a fontanelle. Uh, the non-slip was, the, I guess, the simplest, where it was a rigid outer shell cube uh, fully filled with gel. Uh, the slip phantom had a five millimeter fluid layer between the gel and the outer shell and the gel was uh, neutrally buoyant in the middle. Uh, and finally, the fontanelle phantom was set up where the top surface was, the top rigid surface was completely replaced by a, um, a soft membrane. Um, and on all three of these phantoms, two types of shaking experiments were done. So there was a, uh, a linear shake uh, that was performed and also a, a circular arc shake about a pivot. Uh, so these shakes were done over a range of frequencies and a range of amplitudes, but they were all quite small. So the range of amplitudes ranged from about 20 millimeters to about 50, um, and the frequencies ranged from about 2 to 8 hertz. 8, yes. <laughs> um, so in creating these phantoms, uh, the outer shells were created by acrylic, or using acrylic. Um, the gel that, uh, that I used was a Silgard 527 gel in a 1 to 1.5 mix ratio. Um, this had similar properties to that of the brain, and it's also been used by other um, groups to, kinda, uh, to, to model uh, brain material properties. Uh, the fluid was a mixture of water and alcohol, uh, just because we wanted, it, we wanted it to be the same density as the gel itself, so it would be neutrally buoyant. And the uh, soft latex um, that we used uh, was pre-stretched using the biaxial rig and uh, placed on top of the phantom. The phantoms were also uh, instrumented with pressure transducers, so the pressure in the gel and also the pressure between the gel and the outer shell could be measured uh, throughout these uh, shaking motions. And an MPP301 pressure transducer was used. and um, along with that amplification circuitry and low-pass filters were also added. And finally, a shaking rig had to be set up. So using a linear motor and some lab view code and some laser cutting, um, a, a small shaking rig was done. Uh, you can see the, this is the rig for the arc shake, so it goes about a pivot over here. Um, you could replace that and you could do linear shakes on it as well. Um, Yes, yeah, so a controlled repetitive linear shakes or arc shakes. Um, alongside these fa uh, phantom models, uh, an analytical solution was also derived uh, for, a, for the pressure experience inside the gel um, for a linear shake, not the arc shakes. 
So um, the final, uh, where are we? The final uh, pressure equation is very similar to um, the hydrostatic pressure equation of rho GH. The rho stands for density of both those uh, equations. Um, the H stands, well, the D in here stands for the distance between the two points that you want to measure the pressure between uh, relative to the center. And the acceleration you can see in this little section here is the um, is just the uh, uh, displacement of the phantom in a sinusoidal motion differentiated twice in the, uh, so that's the max acceleration, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so from that equation, you can see that there's a square relationship with frequency, which is f, and a linear relationship with the displacement, which is x. Um, yeah. And then the third part was to create a computational model uh, of these phantom experiments. Um, so ANSYS was used to do that. Uh, both linear and nonlinear material properties were used. Uh, the only nonlinear material property was actually the um, dental dam or the membrane for the fontanel. Um, they were shaken in both a linear and arc shake, and the stresses that were obtained were compared to the pressures from the uh, experimental data and also the analytical data to determine if the uh, model was set up properly or uh, yeah, set up properly to predict the stresses and the strains inside the gel. Uh, so looking at a small overview of the results, um, the pressures experienced by the gel under a linear and circular motion were repro re reproducible in a FE model. You can see it visually here. Um, the dots are the points for the uh, experimental and the FE model predictions, and the line represents the analytical solution. Um, yeah. So this 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 body of work showed us that the um, the results support the use of an ANSYS modeling framework to predict the pressure fields during a shaking motion. Um, and then, so we were happy with how uh, these models panned out. So we thought we'd um, go a step further and make make it a bit more complicated and look at another issue that was seen in um, shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma cases. So the next set of studies or phantom studies that I performed were cylindrical phantom studies. Uh, so the main aim of these was to develop the computational techniques uh, that predicted the deformations of a gel under a rotation acceleration. Uh, rotation motions are quite important, uh, are quite important in abusive head trauma because um, it's those rotational motions that cause the injuries that are seen in most cases. Uh, those rotation motions, there's a um, relative uh, displacement between the um, brain and the skull, which stretches the bridging veins, which then cause them to rupture and subdural hematomas occur. So rotational motions and how, um, how the brain um, moves in relation to the skull under these rotational motions are quite important. So that was the main aim of these set of studies. So again, two sets of phantoms were used, um, a non-slip and a slip, and two sets of experiments, um, low and high acceleration experiments were conducted. Um, I'd like to point out that the non-slip accelerations, I didn't do, the experiments I didn't do myself. Um, the group in America uh, at the NIH um, had, had, had that data before, and um, they were kind enough to give it to me, so I just used that as a validation step in my computational modeling. Um, but for the slip phantom, I, we had to create that. Um, yeah, so as I said, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't set up the uh, non-slip phantom as it was previously conducted by the other group. Uh, but for the slip phantom, um, it was set up, uh, the gel was molded using a PVC pipe, which was handy enough that it came in the right size that we needed. <laughs> uh, a base plate was inserted to the bottom, Art paper and aerodite we used to um, hold the uh, hold the gel onto the base plate, um, and then end caps and the cylinder itself were constructed uh, by Steve. Um, he spent a lot of time on that, so thanks, Steve, if you ever watches this video. Probably not. <laughs> and uh, the fluid again was neutrally buoyant, so. Um, it was a 20, uh, 20 to 80 isopropyl alcohol to water ratio, uh, just to make sure that the uh, cylinder didn't um, flop 
um, when it was placed sideways. Uh, the, sorry, the gel inside the cylinder. Um, yeah, so there were two experiment types that were uh, performed on these phantoms. The first was a low acceleration experiment. So these were about 260 radians per second and uh, 35 degrees rotation. You can see the um, <coughs> rotation, angular rotation. Oh, oh shoot, what did I do? Oh, cool. Cool. Okay. Uh, you can see the uh, profile um, down the bottom right. Oh, bottom left. My left. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the main benefit of these low acceleration experiments was that I could get volumetric data of the displacement of the gel, uh, which, is quite, which is quite valuable when validating the um, models. Um, and these experiments were again done by, the Phantom was constructed here, but it was sent over to America, and they were done by the group in America. Uh, the high acceleration rotation motions were also conducted on the um, non-slip, oh sorry, on the slip phantom, and these experiments were done here. So um, these uh, experiments, the uh, acceleration reached up to 900 radians per second, per second, and they rotated about 180 degrees. Uh, the accelerations were much closer to what was seen in abusive or shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma. Um, and how I captured the deformation was by placing fluorescent markers um, on the bottom or the free end of the gel, rotated it using a motor, and uh, captured that rotation uh, using a camera setup at the bottom. Uh, the only drawback of these experiments was that I, only was, I, I was only able to measure the deformation of the free end. I couldn't measure the um, whole volumetric deformation of the gel. Um, so alongside those phantom models, a computational model was also created. Um, the main thing that we learned from creating the non-slip model was that a viscoelastic material properties were important. Uh, and then from the slip model, uh, we had to set up a fluid structural interaction. Um, initially, uh, I tried to do a, a, a solid fluid. Uh, I tried to um, model the fluid layer as a soft solid with a non-slip boundary condition between the gel and the fluid. Um, but that didn't, that didn't really give us the results that we wanted. So, um, uh, and then when, when I modeled it as a fluid structure interaction, um, the results matched the experimental results much better. Um, yeah, and some of the material properties that we use can be seen in the table below. Uh, so these are some of the results that were done that, that, that I obtained from this body of work. Um, the top graph um, shows the importance of modeling um, the fluid layer as a fluid instead of a soft solid. Um, the red dots are, are, is the RMS error between the uh, model and the experiment um, when it was modeled as a soft solid with a non-slip, uh, with a frictionless boundary condition between the two. And um, the FSI model is seen below. And the FSI model, the RMS areas for the FSI model was uh, all below 1.5, which is the 1.5 millimeters, which is the experimentation error. So we were quite happy with those results. Uh, uh, another type of analysis that I did on these experiments was to determine the relative motion between two points um, along the gel. So uh, for example, a point on the, on the surface of the uh, gel cylinder and the inner surface of the, sorry, the point on the outer surface of the gel and the inner surface of the cylinder. Um, and that was important because it kind of represents the uh, injuries uh, that are seen in abusive head trauma where um, those, uh, those points and those, that line represents the bridging veins uh, that are seen in infants and adults. Um, so again, when we measured the when we compared the strains between these two points along the gel um, for, um, for this set of experiments, we got a good, uh, good match. And you can see that visually here, but um, numerically as well, it was a good match. 
Um, and we were quite happy, um, and uh, the results supported the use of ANSYS, uh, of the ANSYS FSI modeling framework to simulate the deformation of a gel under a rotational motion. Uh, then I moved on to um, using the adult head ex uh, experimentation data to validate those techniques in a more realistic environment. So the main aim was to test previously validated techniques to determine the displacement of the brain using in vivo brain displacements. Uh, the only experiment conducted was low acceleration rotation motions because for safety reasons really, you can't do high acceleration stuff on um, humans or adults. Uh, the, again, you can see the profile, which is similar to the cylinder, cylindrical um, profile, uh, cylindrical rotational, sorry, cylindrical experiments <laughs> uh, on the on that plot there. Um, yeah. So one of the major problems that I faced when um, uh, trying to get this, trying to set up this model was importing geometry into ANSYS. Um, so I segmented the geometry using ITK Snap and then used MeshLab to kind of smooth uh, the complexities of the geometry because I wasn't too interested in that kind of stuff. Um, but the tricky part was going from output from MeshLab into ANSYS, and the solution to that was uh, a program called ISIM, which is part of ANSYS. Um, but that was, uh, yeah, that was tricky and it was hard to get through, but um, I just wanted to point out how I did it, I guess, in this slide. Um, but Hari, who's sitting at the back there, was quite a bit of help <laughs> in getting that. So. Um, cool. Um, so when, uh, yeah, so we, uh, when I segment, when I was trying to segment the MRI data that I got for that adult head experiments, uh, it was quite because there were T two MRIs, it, they were quite hard to differentiate between the CSF and the skull. So what I did was I um, segmented the brain and then I expanded the outer nodes to create artificially create the cerebrospinal fluid and also the skull. Uh, the Falks cerebri and the tentorum um, were also manually added using the longitudinal fissures and the transverse fissures um, that were seen on the brain segmentation. Um, and then once it was finally all set up, it kind of looked like that picture um, where the red's the brain and the blue's the cerebrospinal fluid and so on. Um, and then once that model was, uh, once that mesh was put in, um, uh, the model was set up in this manner. Uh, there was a bonded contact between the optic nerves and the skull that kind of represented the fact that um, how uh, like the eyeball doesn't, you know, get sucked in to the brain or nor does it pop out uh, under these rotational motions. And the frictionless, uh, there was a frictionless contact condition between the brain stem and the skull as well. Um, to represent the motion of the brainstem up and down. Uh, another problem that was encountered when I was doing this work was uh, even, even for these low acceleration experiments, um, there were small parts of the skull, uh, of the brain, that were seen to um, interact with the skull, and that interaction would um, cause the fluid elements to collapse, which would then. Um, crash the simulation. So the way I overcame this was to um, use an offset frictionless boundary condition. So that was pretty much, I created another contact, a non-slip contact condition between the brain and the skull and I offset it by a small amount um, so that the brain wouldn't directly get in contact with the skull. It would um, it, it, it'd be in direct contact with a little small outer uh, I guess like an imaginary outer surface, so then the fluid elements wouldn't collapse pretty much. Um, yeah, and some of the material properties that we used, they were, th these were all from literature. Oh, I forgot to take the references when I copied it from my thesis. Uh, but yeah, they're all from literature, so. Um, so this is some of the results that, that was obtained from this body of work. Uh, one major finding was that um, 
the importance of modeling the faults in the tentorum. Um, as you can see, when they weren't included uh, by, um, in the model, as you can see from the red dots, uh, the brain um, rotated uh, by, uh, by more than what it actually did in the exper experiments. Um, whereas when they were included, they protected the, rota uh, they protected the brain and, and it rotated less, and, um, which is more like what was seen in experiments. So I guess one important finding from this body of work was that um, the importance of modeling the folks in the tentorum. Um, in adult and infant, um, well, mainly, well, in adult uh, simulations, but you could probably apply it to infant simulations as well. Um, the other results were that uh, the displacement between the experimental and the modeling framework, uh, and the, sorry, uh, the computational model, uh, agreed within the experimental measurement error. As I mentioned earlier, it indicated the importance of the faults in the tentorum. Um, and finally, the, uh, I guess you could say that the computational techniques that were used in creating this model um, ha had been validated against in vivo human data, low acceleration in vivo human data. Um, yeah. So then the final part of my thesis was to apply those computational techniques and um, create an infant model, uh, infant head model. So the main aim of this was to create an FE model of an infant head and use this model to predict the strains in the bridging veins, the optic nerve forces, and the von Meyse stresses. Uh, the bridging vein strains would give us um, an indication of if the bridging veins would rupture, um, and uh, which would indicate if subdural hematomas would occur. The optic nerve forces would tell us if um, uh, retinal hematoma, well, we, we hypothesized that the optic nerve forces would tell us if retinal hematomas would occur. Uh, there hasn't been that much work done on that area. And finally, the one mice stress has indicated if uh, traumatic brain injury um, would occur or not. Um, when trying to incorporate the geometry into the model, um, I used an infant atlas that was readily available. Um, when I, oh yeah, infant atlas. Um, so the way I did this was, uh, they had all the parts segmented, um, but what I used, I used a, a cerebral spinal fluid segmentation, and I made everything inside it, the, um, uh, the brain, and expanded that by a small amount to um, get the skull, because I didn't really care too much about the uh, the outer surface of the skull. It was more the inner surface that was, um, I guess, contained in that cerebral spinal fluid segmentation. Um, again, the folks and tentorum were added manually, and so was the fontanelle, optic nerves, and brainstem. Um, I used just a literature and figured out um, uh, where they should go, and then I kind of verified it using um, by asking a few pediatricians at um, in the hospital as well. So the boundary condition uh, used for this model were the outputs from the model that Tom uh, had created. So there were two types of shaking motions that he had um, uh, discussed in his thesis, and they were an arc and a linear shake. So uh, a linear shake is when you shake the infant torso linearly, so that would still result in the head um, moving in a rotation and a linear fashion. And the arc shake is in the, when the torso is shaken in an arc uh, motion, uh, which would also cause the head to uh, rotate and, yeah, the head to rotate. Uh, the shaken inputs um, had a frequency of about two hertz, and um, it was the first time realistic shaken inputs like that had been used in a, in a, in a model to uh, about um, abuse of head trauma. Uh, another um, boundary condition that was implemented was the forces on the neck. Um, so when the head, w w uh, when the neck is under hyperextension or hyperflexion, uh, it pulls and uh, the, the brain stem pulls and pushes on the brain. And we wanted to incorporate this into the model. So Bilston et al. had um, written a paper 
on the fossil of the vertebrae. And um, from that, I was able to get the uh, <coughs> forces on the, uh, on the brain stem, and I used that as a boundary condition um, uh, at the base of the brain stem. Um, yep. Uh, yep, so the uh, contact conditions were again very similar to what was used in the adult head model. Uh, there was a frictionless boundary condition between the brain stem and the skull and a bonded between, between the outer edge of the optic nerves and the skull that it was protruding through. Uh, again, the um, uh, skull-brain interaction had to be included because this definitely, there was a lot more um, uh, uh, interaction between the brain and the skull under these high acceleration motions. <coughs> um, so an offset frictionless boundary condition was used. And... Um, the material properties used are shown as seen below. So they were all obtained from literature. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, when trying to analyze results, so the strains of the bridging veins were obtained by using um, two types, the, to, uh, a set of nodes on the, on the outer surface of the skull and a set of nodes on the inner, sorry, outer surface of the brain and a set of nodes in the inner surface of the brain. Uh, they weren't, um, I guess they weren't explicitly modeled. They were, uh, I was just tracking the displacement of each of those nodes um, throughout the experiment and figuring out the strains between them. Um, the forces at the end of the optic nerve were also calculated and, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the maximum on mice stresses were part of it as well. Uh, yeah. Um, so when, when I was when I was analysing the results, one of the one of the interesting results that came about it was um, the shear wave that was seen to propagate through the brain. Um, so when when the brain when the head moves forward, um, the brain lags behind. And especially in, the, in those kind of accelerations, there's a contact between the brain and the skull. And that causes, well, in this model at least, it seemed to cause um, this shear wave um, uh, to travel on the outer surface of the skull, as you can see from the little red wave throughout the time series. Um, so I did a bit of investigation and figured out that analytically, if a shear, uh, if a shear wave was to traverse a material of that nature, it would be around about 0 0.73 meters a second. And the, um, what was measured was about 0 0.78. So, uh, so you, yeah, you, you could say that it wasn't like a computational artifact. Um, and that, yeah, it, it, yeah something like that should have, should have happened. Um, uh, another set of, I guess, another outcome from this, these experiments was um, it showed the importance of modeling the fontanelle and the bending, or the, I guess, the lack of importance. Um, so you can see the, uh, the comparison between the model with the fontanelle and without the fontanelle on, the, on your left and uh, the comparison between the model with the neck forces and five, oh, no neck forces, five times the neck force and the, and the neck forces on the right. Um, and at least visually there's no difference, well you can't see there much of a difference. And that was also the case numerically as well. Um, I, I wasn't too surprised with the for neck forces, just because the forces on the neck weren't as much as the forces experienced by the uh, experienced by the head itself, um, but I was a bit surprised by the fontanelle, just because the um, uh, there was quite a there was a, there was there was a marked difference between the fontanelle phantom and the um, non fontanelle phantoms in the cube experiments. But I guess the main difference between those experiments and this was that uh, in those cube phantoms, the fontanelle covered the whole surface. Um, of the, the whole top surface of the phantom, whereas in, in this infant model, it was only like a small, um, uh, maybe twice the size of a 50 cent piece kind of uh, 
circle that was at the top of the, the top of the infant skull. So, yeah. So thinking about it, probably it probably wouldn't have made a difference, but yeah, I was a bit surprised. Um, and then I uh, uh, then I investigated the uh, br uh, the strains in the bridging veins and von Mises stresses. Um, so there was some previous literature that was done on the material properties of the bridging veins and their uh, rupture thresholds and um, a strain of 0 0.5 was um, a maximum strain of 0 0.5 was what was considered a um, uh, was, was what was considered the strain that was needed for them to rupture. Um, so the bridging veins did exceed that injury threshold. Uh, the von Mises stresses again are used um, injury thresholds from literature and uh, it only exceeded the threshold briefly at the very start. Um, and that may be a reason why you don't really see concussions um, and traumatic brain injury in many of the infants um, with abuse of head trauma. Ah, oh, that's wrong acronym, sorry. Um, and there was no data or injury threshold for the optic nerve forces, um, so they were just, um, uh, which, yeah, they were just stated, I guess. Because the model predicted that bridging veins would rupture, I investigated, um, well, I guess I compared my results to some previous li literature. Um, so there hasn't been that much um, case studies, I guess, on, uh, done on um, the number of bridging veins that are seen to rupture, just on the size of the hematomas that are seen, pretty much. Uh, but they mainly occur near the anterior fontanelle. Um, and that's where that, that's that's why I had all those those eight bridging veins near that area because that's where the anterior fontanelle was, but I didn't I didn't model all the bridging veins going all throughout the skull. Um, so when comparing it to previous uh, infant models, the two major ones were Morrison's and Roth et al.'s um, models. Uh, the main difference between uh, the models were that my, uh, that my model used a, a realistic um, shaking inputs. So uh, their inputs were mainly um, an arc shake about a pivot, uh, whereas mine, I guess, contained, part of it was that and also it had that linear portion, portion to it as well. And secondly, the major difference was the brain material properties. Um, I was using a, a, a hyperelastic model um, which was published recently on infant brain properties, um, whereas they were using linear viscoelastic properties uh, of an adult brain, and there was a big difference in the um, um, in the softness of the materials. Um, so, but even with uh, even with those, so both of those differences would um, uh, increase the strains on the on, on the bridging veins, and um, uh, the results that I showed, uh, the, uh, my results kind of were higher than theirs, but that was expected just because of the differences. So we were quite happy um, with the output from my model. Um, yeah, uh, as with most models, there were some limitations um, with the work that I did. Uh, the validation limitations, so most of the validated techniques, the comp computation techniques that I validated against were against low acceleration deformations, uh, uh, low acceleration motions. Um, and I was trying to predict mechanical indices under high accelerations. So there was a discrepancy in that and um, that needs to be investigated further. Uh, and also the types of motions were different. Um, the shaking motions were much more complex than what I validated against for both the adult head and the phantom experiments. Uh, there were also material property limitations. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I got the material properties from literature, existing literature, 
and I wasn't able to do a sensitivity. Well, wasn't it wasn't practical for me to do a sensitive sensitivity analysis, um, just because the simulations themselves took about 13 days, and to do a proper sens sens sensitivity uh, analysis would take a long time. Um, and there were also geometric limitations as well. Um, so you might have noticed that I um, smoothed the brain, so the sulci and the gyri were removed, and um, the skull that I was using was was totally solid apart from that small fontanelle, whereas in actual infants, um, they aren't solid. There's a, they're quite malleable and they do move um, because of the, uh, the different number of the um, fontanelles and the sutures that traverse throughout the skull. Um, the novel contributions from the work that I did was uh, I used in vivo data to validate an adult human head. Um, I showed the importance of modeling the FOLX and the Tentorum uh, for an adult human head. Uh, for the infant model, I used realistic shake and bounder conditions. Um, I included the bending of the neck and the forces on the optic nerve were identified as well. Uh, so the conclusions, the main conclusions from my research, I thought I'd just summarize everything in, in one slide. Uh, the main research question is, is shaking alone sufficient to elicit the injuries seen in abusive head trauma? The main aim of my thesis was to predict the mechanical indices in the infant brain under a shaking motion. Uh, uh, and uh, the main research contribution was the construction of a final element model of an infant head using uh, validated techniques. And um, I hope that this thesis will help to clarify the mechanisms linking shaking and the brain damage that is seen in many infants. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to th acknowledge, make some acknowledgements. So to Paul, Marty and Andrew, um, I call them the three wise men. Uh, they were my supervisors from fourth year even till now. Well, yeah. <laughs> so thanks heaps for all your help. Uh, for Fa Frank and Patrick, they're the two pediatricians who um, started uh, this project, you could say. Um, to Andy and Zun Fan, um, who were the collaborators from uh, NIH in America, uh, they supplied me with a lot of data and even performed some of the um, cylindrical phantom experiments. So thanks heaps for that. Oh, sorry. Um, where were we? Oh, yeah. Uh, Therese, Darshini, and Sophia, uh, <laughs> uh, the fluffy crew is what we called ourselves. Um, uh, to the guys on level five, um, and pretty much everyone um, on ABI, really. Uh, to Brad, who's sitting in the front there. Tom, who's in the corner. Um, without his work, I wouldn't have had the boundary conditions. Um, schoolmates and uni friends, and yeah. Steve and Garish and everyone. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank Isri. Um, I, I met her when I moved to, moved to Melbourne and she was a great help, especially at the very end when it's quite hard to finish off a PhD while you're, while you're working and, and, and also overseas. And um, yeah, she pulled me through it. And um, she doesn't have a moustache, but I thought that was a cute picture. Um, and also Tata Menaya, that's uh, Singhalese from dad, mum and big brother, who you can see down the bottom. Thank you. I did do a small investigation into that, and we did go down that path, but just because uh, there was a good match between the experimental data and the computational model, I didn't really investigate it much further than that. Um, but I 
it is pretty simple. And if you get rid of the viscosity of, so without the, without the fluid, you mean? Yeah. Um, um, I assume there would be, um, but the viscosity of the of the gel itself. Oh, sorry, not the viscosity. Um, the 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 time dependent features, the material properties of the gel itself might influence it. But yeah. Yeah, because you have um, another one, which is your analytic solution for the break when you have the contact, right? And the baby head contact, you have the analytic speed for the shock wind. Yeah, yeah, that that, that was just a sim simple uh, like um, shear wave propagation equation. Without taking into account. Uh, yeah, I didn't take into account the boundary conditions. It was just a, the the speed of a blob, well, a sp uh, the speed of a wave tr that they would transfer, they would traverse um, uh, an object like that uh, without taking into account boundary conditions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so really nice work. Thank you. <laughs> so it's just. Uh, Wondering about the magnitude of the deformation seen in both the phantom and the uh, the actual anatomical models, I was just wondering what the magnitude of the deformation was because you're getting very good, uh, well, very low RMS uh, mm -hmm. errors uh, using parameters from the literature, which mm -hmm. I was wondering what were the relative um, sort of well, what what was the magnitude of the deformation relative to that error. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, off the top of my head, the strains were less than five percent in the adult head model. Um, the magnitude defam uh, the absolute deformations. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Sorry. Yeah, um, I, was, I was just wondering because. Uh just but wondering if the parameters are at all sensitive. It might because it, this might be a problem that's dominated mainly by incompressibility. Yeah. Um, just thinking because so you, you 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 didn't have a chance to do a parameter sensitivity. Sensitivity, not even on, on the. the uh, I, I I didn't do it on the adult just because I, I guess I didn't want to go down that path. Just it sure. it wasn't yeah. But for the phantoms, did you have a look at that for the phantoms? Uh no. Because right. okay. um, I was yeah. just thinking, if, if, if it might, you might find that the parameters are not the problem is not sensitive to the parameters. Parameters. Which would so, be, uh, interesting. Yeah. So for the linear for the linear uh, shakes, they weren't dependent on the the pressure experience wasn't dependent on any of the material properties, right. um, just from the analytical solution. Yeah. Um, so for the arc shakes, uh, you could probably say it might be the same. Um, yeah. That's quite an interesting outcome because uh, when you have complicated models, then the parameters aren't that important. Because I've seen yeah, that before. argument before okay. with some of Carol Bell's work. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. But that would be ignoring the effects of rota relative rotation. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So for linear stuff, yeah, but that doesn't actually normally work because the head is moving. Moving up and down. Yep. I've been asked to ask you, oh. by somebody who won't be named, what the, answer, the first question in your conclusions was, the main research question. The main research question? Yeah. So how much does, um, how much does it account for the actual effect you're looking at? Say that again, so which? That first one. So you've you put it as a conclusion, is shaking alone sufficient for this Oh, what well, the answer to that is? Yeah. Um, I'm going to be very diplomatic in this answer. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the model that I created um, does show that um, shaking alone is sufficient um, to cause injuries that are seen. Um, but there are limitations to that model, which I think should be incorporated in making conclusions. Um, um, yeah, yeah. So, so the model that I've created with the limitations, um, with its limitations, do show that injuries are seen. Can I ask a follow-up one of my own devising? Yep. 
so these are obviously quite challenging presentations. Can you say a bit more about how you modelled or what you modelled the fluid as in the simulations? Did you assume what? it was Newtonian, for example? Yeah. Yeah. You compressed all Newtonian. Yeah. Do you know how Newtonian uh, yes, well, most of the, uh, most of the previous models that have set up an FSI modeling framework, for mo um, we're looking at head, head uh, models that use uh, that, as those assumptions. Um, so that's I, mean, I, don't know, I don't know the answer, I'm just yeah, 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 yeah. long yep. that might make it... You know, Not, yeah. Um, so that that was probably the main reason why I, why I went down that route, um, but yeah, I, I, uh, I, 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 yeah, yeah. So previous models had used that, and that's that's why I kind of did it. But I, I don't know the um, I don't know the uh, the exact material properties of the super spinal fluid. Slightly related, come back in one step. So, for your for your FSI model, what, what, how do you define your contact between your fluid and your structural elements? Uh, so that that, that was uh, so that was a two-way FSI model that I set up, um, and the um, interactions kind of uh, I guess aut automatically set up using answers. You need some kind of context stiffness for sure. Sorry. Did you have faults or you, you must have to define context stiffness? Context stiffness? Uh, I don't think so. Not that I know. There, were, there, were, there was some um, validation that I did uh, to just double check the FSI uh, system, or well, FSI setup was modeled correctly, just some buoyancy tests and things like that. Um, but I can't remember a stiffness condition. Not off the top of my head. So there's no free surface, I guess, so maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah, no, there's no, yeah, there's no free surface here. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm sure we let the mechanic off and save our really hard questions. For, for the beer. <laughs> okay, can you join me in...